Buju, hello everyone. Thank you for tuning into the Cashew Podcast. I hope you are finding time to rest, are staying hydrated, and remembering to eat and nourish yourselves. We recorded today's episode with Dr. Mary Harrison a couple weeks ago, and at the time we were mainly focused on how reflective practice can be a resource to use during the pandemic. However, we hope that this information will feel just as helpful today as we watch and maybe even participate in an uprising that's taking place locally, nationally, and even globally. During our conversation, Mary shares more about how reflective practice can help us check in with ourselves, both our minds and our bodies, and how we can check in with others and how we show up for each other collectively. We hope you find this conversation helpful during this time. Please be well. Please take care. Thank you everyone for tuning into the Cashew Podcast. Today I'm talking with Mary Harrison. Mary, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you. How are you? You know, I'm hanging in there. You know, it's a a day by day. (laughs) Yeah, great is uh, in maybe in air quotes. I don't know. (laughs) Yes. Um, Could you introduce yourself and just share a little bit more about yourself and your work? Sure. Um, Thank you for having me. My name is Mary Harrison, and I work at the University of Minnesota at the Center for Early Education and Development, which is part of the Institute of Child Development. So um, what we do is take research and translate it for practitioners, um, and with my focus being translating research on infant mental health and uh, early social and emotional development for uh, child welfare professionals. So I've been in this position for a number of years and um, have a background in clinical social work as well as uh, infant mental health practice with children and families birth to eight. Part of that includes providing something called reflective supervision to practitioners who are working directly with families and also participating in my own reflective supervision um, which is a form of professional development and support for anybody working with children um, and families birth to eight. Awesome. Thank you. You know, in just a few weeks ago, you wrote what I would describe as a beautiful article about reflective practice. And you began with a quote that I think really stood out to myself and, and many, I'm sure. Could you say that quote to the folks who are listening and maybe have not read the article yet and just talk a little bit about why it's so important right now during this time. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Yes, the quote is, how you are is as important as what you do. And it comes from a woman, Jari Paul, uh, who has been part of, who was part of the infant mental health field for a number of years and is really a an important person, an inspiration to people working in that field. There's such a focus in our culture on on doing, um, accomplishing, having a to-do list and checking things off. And sometimes we forget that who we are as a human and how we are in relationships with people is just as important as whatever it is we're trying to accomplish. And that if we're not uh, mindful and careful and reflective about how we are, uh, we, we may not be able to accomplish things in the way that we hope. Why is that so important to remember right now? Well, it's something that I try to remind myself um, because we're at a time when things are chaotic and unpredictable and unknown. And for many of us, the natural response to that is to want to grasp um, harder onto things, um, grasp more tightly or uh, try to control things, try to... um, be able to predict things. And that is that really calls for that doing part. And that often comes at the expense of the being part, how we are. And so uh, in the article, I wrote a little bit just about, well, how are we? Um, how do we know how we are? How do I know how I am? And how do I reflect on and think about how I am when I'm interacting with my children, when I'm interacting with my partner, when I'm interacting um, over email with teachers and coworkers and whoever it is um, I'm 
being with? And, and even when I'm interacting with myself, how is the voice in my own head? Am I kind and compassionate to myself during this time? Or am I putting pressure on myself because I feel so uh, disempowered by everything that's going on? So really reflective practice of which reflective supervision is just a small part, but reflective practice is really about... Um, I mean, exactly what it says, being reflective, thinking about how you feel, feeling things in response to what you're thinking, and using that process to inform how you do your work and sort of how you carry yourself through the world. It's, it's sort of like mindfulness um, in action. So the reflective practice uh, process involves checking in with your own body, with your own thoughts to see where you're holding your stress, what kinds of things are you thinking about, and then also uh, very purposely, or the reflective supervision or consultation part, um, invites people to sort of purposefully uh, engage in compassionate conversations with others so that you have an opportunity to really um, slow down and notice what's happening and therefore have a little bit more um, influence over how you are, how you are in response to others and how you are um, in response to, you know, things you read, things you see, all of that. Um, it's really just inviting us to slow down and realize that we have, we do have choices in what we expose ourselves to and we have choices in how we respond to things and that taking time to think about and feel things and taking time to connect with others in compassionate conversations um, is a really uh, healthy and helpful part of, of being in the world. Absolutely. And in thinking about parents and caregivers or just other folks who are home and are supporting young ones right now and, and, and the little people of our lives, do you, is there any advice you would share or are there things that you're doing as a parent yourself to kind of reflect and model behaviors to your kiddos during this time that you think would be helpful for folks to know and remember? You know, overall, if, if reflective practice is inviting us to pay attention to how we are, that's what I am trying to do. And I will say that there's not a finish line or a day when you think, oh, I've really got it down now. I know how to be patient and kind and compassionate with my children. Um, instead, every, you know, minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, hour is um, presents new opportunities <laughs> to try to take a deep breath and um, be present and take the perspective of your child or your partner or whomever. Um, and really be intentional about how you are. So for me, working, I have children in school. Um, we're trying to do homeschool. And, but I, and I imagine, you know, if I had babies or toddlers, I mean, it's, you're in a house 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a lot of stimulation. It's a lot of sounds and sights and being pulled in many directions. It can feel very, um, overstimulating and chaotic. You can feel trapped. You can feel um, helpless, hopeless, depending. So for people who've experienced trauma, this can, be, this can be very triggering for them because they there are a lot of things beyond their control. And um, it can be really helpful to remind yourself and even to set up times in the day um, or, and even specific people with whom you can uh, connect to ground you, to um, bring you back to that reflective, self-compassionate place so that when you are, when a, your toddler climbs on your lap or your baby's crying overnight or your, you know, um, kids can't figure out their homeschool things or your teenager is screaming at you or someone in your family is ill or just anything, even the happy things, um, you have sort of more bandwidth as people are talking about these days, you have a little bit more 
uh, emotional and even physiological energy to bring to those interactions. And you can be a little bit more intentional and responsive rather than reactive. And so that's, that's always my personal goal is to try to um, pause and respond um, to whatever my children are asking of me or partner or what I'm asking of myself, um, rather than being reactive in a in a self-critical way or in a critical way of, you know, with the children. Um, and it's very real to feel that. Uh, I think I would, I'd love to meet the parent who never <laughs> uh, reacts to their, to their children in a way with, you know, a strong, strong words or just a lot of ways that we can overreact. Um, but the more we can center ourselves and find uh, ways to be responsive, which really takes them into account, you know, you're responding to something that they're showing you, something that they're asking you. And that requires a, a little bit of calmness somewhere in you. And when you run out of calmness and kindness, it's time to find a way to replenish yourself. Um, a lot of our culture focuses on self-care in forms of um you know, uh, things that make you feel good. Um, and that is great. But there's something really valuable about uh, having a reflective conversation with a trusted colleague or friend, where they just can let you help you find the self compassion, help you help let you be human and imperfect and struggling. And so what I'm doing is really trying to intentionally um, notice when I'm, you know, getting this. Sometimes people talk about like that green, yellow, red, when I'm getting yellow or red in my um, reactions um, or physiology or feelings, if I'm irritated, if I'm tired, if I'm hungry, all of that, and figuring out um, some sy systematic ways, I guess now that we're several weeks into that, to reset. So there are a couple of times in the day that I purposely do um, actually a meditation that I that's free to people. I'm guessing we can include the link or something on Insight Timer, which is an app. It's specifically about, you know, times of uncertainty, and it's about nine minutes long. And I just do that um, every day, at least once a day, sometimes twice a day to just try to reset myself. But then I also engage in these um, reflective conversations with colleagues um, or friends, I should say, um, who, colleagues who are friends, who can help me um, slow down, who can help me, uh, help remind me of what is it that children really need um, what do I need? They need me to put my own oxygen mask on first. They need me to be emotionally present for them. Um, if I have overreacted, they need me to come back around and repair my relationship with them. And, you know, I, I find it helpful to have that reflected back to me in conversation um, because then I am better able to bring a uh, more patient, kinder, compassionate self to parenting, which is frankly the hardest thing I've ever done. And for many people, the hardest thing we'll ever do um, day in and day out parenting. And, you know, with everything, with all of the sort of abrupt changes with, you know, everyone shifting to working from home and social distancing and some of our restrictions in, in your work with reflective supervision and consultation, have you seen any changes to that work so far, um, you know, since the pandemic has started as far as how that work continues or what that looks like currently? Sure. Um, okay. So if I'm thinking about what's different now uh, versus when I was providing reflective consultation before the lockdown and the pandemic time, um, we're all bringing less to the interaction. Everybody that I've interacted with is preoccupied to some degree or another with concerns of safety um, for themselves, for their loved ones, for their community. Um, there's sort of a, a low level and then for some people a mid-level and high level of 
anxiety and there's also levels of grief. People are are separated from each other. People have anticipatory grief where they're concerned about um, losing someone. There's There are just a lot of heavy feelings and heavy physiological experiences that people are bringing to their work, which makes it that much harder to focus. It makes it harder to be present for others. And then as I have reflective conversations with people, um, I'm noticing that people are just, in general, they're more emotionally fatigued. But then there's also this this computer fatigue. There's, there's a, a real... Um, difficulty with how with the fact that we don't have the nonverbal cues that we're used to we're having to try to connect emotionally with people and coworkers um over a uh, you know computer screen and 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 it just it doesn't feed our soul in the way that it might that we need it to and it and we may not feel as effective uh in our work as we would want to and so you know, that I just keep thinking the apple cart is turned upside down. Nothing quite feels the same. And is how can we um, how can we acknowledge that um, and then see? So then, what do we do in the meantime? You know, how can we uh, try to find some peace inside ourselves? Try to find ways to feel connected, even though we're looking at computer screens and even though we're holding all of these worries and. Um, even though we don't, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't have control. Um, it sort of invites us to, um, you know, really in real time in every conversation and everything that we're doing to uh, practice our own sort of self-regulation or co-regulation. Practice asking others to help us um, find a way to be calm or centered or help us grieve. Um, it really calls to our very basic uh, functions as humans um, in a in a way that's that can be empowering if we can tap into it. Yeah, you know, and and this is making me think too. One thing in conversations we've had related to the work you do and in our partnership is, and we and thinking of our child welfare workforce. Sometimes it's just so helpful to know the words. And help and getting help and like formulating like, but how do I take this concept and like, what does that look like in words? Like, how do I say that? And then that matched with me thinking of our, you know, frontline workers, maybe, for example, who are still doing this important and challenging work in a pandemic, also potentially have kids and a family at home. And so they're managing multiple levels of this. And... I'm just wondering if you have any advice then for them, how do they even begin to have the words to like communicate that to others? Whatever word makes most sense to them. I keep hearing people use the the idea of bandwidth. You know, I don't have any more sort of like I'm at capacity or my, I don't have any more space or whatever. Um, I do think that because some of these experiences are, more universal. Um, people are, I've found people are more open to uh, being compassionate and understanding when people are reaching their limit. Um, they have more grace to offer, more um, space to offer. And so uh, finding a way to just ask for that or say, I need space, I need time, I'm at my limit, I need to take s- some deep breaths. Um, sort of empowering yourself or giving yourself that um, permission and then giving yourself an incredible amount of grace and um, compassion for the fact that there are so few things that are within your control. Really what you're able to control is your own breath, your own ability to try to be present for a family, your own ability to try to get done what you're able to get done, and then finding a visual way to let it go, whether it's balloons of, you know, I used to have the image of balloons with each one of them with like the things I just wasn't, I wish I could have done that day and I wasn't able to do. But, um, you know, finding a way to, to 
create a meaningful story for yourself about what your mind and your body go through um, when you're doing your work and then um, sharing that, sharing that with colleagues or supervisors. And, and I'm guessing people will resonate. This is a, it's, you know, stress management, quote unquote, self-regulation, co-regulation, meaning somebody helping you manage your stress. These are universal human experiences. And um, the more we can get descriptive about what we're experiencing, the more we invite others to wonder about themselves and then join us in that. You know, I, I think... Um, I can't remember if it was a previous podcast or another thing that I heard um, Dr. Ann Garrity talk about, but she talked about that we need people to keep us company. Um, that's kind of what we're doing when we tell people how we're feeling um, with stress, when we tell them I'm at my limit. Um, we're inviting them to keep us company as we're figuring out how to manage all of the things being asked of us. And it turns out we're wired to ask for and accept help from others. You know, we're in a culture that really values individualism and doing it yourself and not needing anybody. And yet physiologically and biologically, we're wired to need others and to um, be able to ask for and, and accept help from others, even when that help looks like a listening ear or validation that we're doing the best we can. And so the more we can weave that into our everyday um, work, our everyday family life, our everyday existence, the healthier many people will feel. Yeah, and we we had a conversation with um, Dr. Ann Garrity recently. And uh, so I love that you mentioned that because we, we talked about some of this as well around um, collective healing and support. Mm -hmm. And how important it is more than ever right now to check in with each other, to be vulnerable, to say, like you said, once we open up and we kind of get past maybe the uncomfort of being vulnerable and sharing, like, I'm having a really hard time today. And and once we're able to do that, that it does create a safe space. You know, it, it kind of opens that up um, with others then to be like, you know what, me too, or at least maybe if I'm not ready to share that now, you've done it. And maybe the next time we connect, I'll feel a little more comfortable and ready to be a little bit more open as well. Um, and so we're just seeing a lot more between colleagues or friends or family of just check-ins. Like, how are you doing? What can I do? What support do you need? Wherever you're at, that's okay. If you don't need anything, mm -hmm. I'll keep checking in, you know? Yeah. I think it's, I'm so glad to hear that. And I've noticed it too. And it's it really bringing us back to some of our you know human roots of that we are we need each other um and that that's okay and that we that there's in, can be incredible healing power in um very simple interactions in feeling like you're part of a community in feeling that collective um effort and collective healing process and collective grieving and 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 knowing that you belong, that you belong to somebody and that you're important to somebody. Um, I think those are, are very basic needs and this is really inviting us to get back in touch with those and also to offer that kind of support to others. Yeah. And I wonder if you, would you like to share just a little about some of the, like you've been working hard on some really great uh, training resources this year that are really bringing and introducing reflective supervision and consultation more to the field of child welfare. And so I don't know if you just want to, you know, you'd have to go super in depth, but just kind of like, what have you been working on this year? And that folks can be keeping an eye out in the coming weeks and that'll be available through Cashew and um, through our website. And, and we'll share more about that too. But Yes. Yes. It's been a great year. Um, we, uh, in the past, I have provided reflective consultation actually over this year as well, reflective consultation to uh, child welfare professionals working with children in um, or at risk of out-of-home placement. And I've done that for a number of years and have taken that experience um, and help let it help inform the creation of two videos that will be available soon. 
One of them is, uh, is actually an animated video, really just describing what is reflective supervision or reflective consultation, um, especially, especially within a child welfare professional context. Uh, the reason we liked the idea of, the, of animation is because we wanted to be able to portray uh, workers and um, families without having to use uh, real people or real situations. We wanted something um, that would invite people to consider the process without focusing on any specific um, story of a specific family. Um, just to sort of keep it at a very uh, high level, just dipping dipping our toe into what is this. And then a more in-depth um, video that we have completed um, includes interviews with people in the child welfare field, um, either providing reflective consultation to child welfare professionals or doing the direct practice work um, with fam children and families to talk about uh, their experience having participated in or providing reflective consultation within this particular work context and how it's been beneficial for them in their own words. And so we're excited about the fact that it's almost like we're fleshing it out. Um, it's, you know, these are buzzwords. These are things people have heard about. There might be some folks in a county here or there who have had the opportunity to participate, but it's it's not really a, um, a universally understood uh, model yet. And by creating these videos, we're able to kind of paint a picture of what, what might it, what is it? What could it be? What could it look like for folks? And what has it looked like for people who have been able to participate? So we're excited to be fleshing that out um, a little bit. And then we're in the process of creating a longer training video um, to go more in depth sort of, and then along with it, some uh, materials that will be available to be downloaded and reads, you know, short one page type things all the way up to a little bit more in depth um, guidelines for best practices and things like that. So that people who are really interested in um, exploring and possibly embedding this into their teams, into their counties, into their work, um, will have a lot of uh, resources to consider. Yeah. And we will, for folks listening, as those videos and, and new training products come available in the coming weeks, we'll share them on our Cashew website and folks can subscribe to our email updates right on our website so they get it as soon as they come out. And we're really excited about this. I'm really excited about the animated video and just kind of, it's always great to have this information in different formats and um, just to have a variety. And, and, our, and through our partnership, we've been able to do so much of that and it's been really great. Well, I know I'm my infant mental health colleagues and I are incredibly grateful for the support of Cashew uh, in creating these because it's something that we've needed uh, in order to sort of get everybody on the same page. It's it's a hard model to describe. It's a hard concept to explain, and it's it it's so lovely now to be able to have some visual. Um, and sort of mixed media ways of engaging in what is this and what can it be? Because those of us who have participated in it, either receiving reflective consultation or supervision or providing, um, have seen some really incredible results uh, as far as reducing um, people's feelings of burnout and compassion fatigue and increasing their feelings of being effective in their work. And that's so exciting. It, it it would be great to be able to offer it to more folks in child welfare. So uh, we really appreciate the ability to create these videos and the support that we've received. You know, you've been navigating so much change and, and you're home with your kiddos and you're working and many days things can feel heavy, but I'm wondering if you could share kind of what is bringing you hope right now. It's interesting. I am finding myself turning to nature uh, in a way that I hadn't been intentionally doing before, um, before this pandemic. I, you know, I try to get outside each day because otherwise we're trapped inside 24 hours a day. And when I'm outside, I'm noticing, you know, it's spring. Um, even on the days that it's raining or a few weeks ago when it was hailing and sleeting and snowing, um, the 
the presence of plants and trees and the evolution of buds into leaves and into flowers. And I'm finding myself having to focus on those very micro level changes and micro level creations of beauty. And interestingly, in just a recent reflective consultation I provided with a person, we talked about just the word of possibilities. Um, she has a new garden uh, in a new place that she's living, and she is curious what will come up, um, what perennials will come up that she didn't know were even there. And we talked about how as hard as um, it is to hold in our minds and our hearts the struggle that we see many children and families experiencing we can also hold a small space for the possibility of connection and growth and change. Um, and we can hold in ourselves an intention of noticing uh, growth and change wherever it might be. If it's, you know, in the tree outside our window, if it's in the, in our yard, if it's something even online, um, what, what are some possibilities of beauty that we can see? Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, Mary, so much for taking time to chat with me today and share a little bit more about reflective practice and your work with reflective supervision and consultation and some of the kind of exciting upcoming projects folks can keep an eye out for. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. This podcast was brought to you by the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare. This podcast was produced by Karina Berry. Our series editors were Denise Cooper and Cliff Dahlberg. Music was composed by Big Cats. And this podcast was supported in part by a grant from the Minnesota Department of Human Services, Children and Family Services Division. For more information, please visit the CASHU website at cascw.umn.edu. Thank you for listening and stay well, everyone.